I'm Matt, and I'm Tim. Uh, how many of y'all have been to one of our lectures before? Dang, we can't mail it in. I thought we were just getting the same jokes. So I guess we got to do something different. So we try to do something a little different for y'all. Normally we're doing like new and exciting plants. That's one of our most popular talks. Uh, tonight we're actually going to talk about the stories behind a lot of plants. So it's uh, a little bit more story-centric and a little bit more about kind of the, the stories behind the trees. And so many of y'all know about us. Uh, we are a small milder nursery. We ship all across the country. Um, if any of y'all pre-ordered plants, just a heads up, they're actually out front in the circle. So you can find them, they've got your tags on them with your names on them. Uh, and we really appreciate y'all having us. It's such a blessing and honor to be here. Every year we're like, wow, they wanna, they wanna see us again. Okay, great. Let's <laughs> come down from the mountains. And uh, if you hadn't got a chance to, uh, we recently featured on an episode of Growing a Greener World. So you can see, catch that on PBS. It airs about every month and a half. Uh, if you'd like to see a little bit of our story, also uh, features Tony in there <laughs> a little bit. Our guest star, which yeah, he makes a cameo for sure. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, we were honored and blessed that we recently just got asked to be in Our State Magazine. So they're coming to do a photo shoot this fall, so keep an eye out uh, coming up for... Probably uh, one more year. <laughs> yeah, probably, <laughs> probably next, next summer or fall whenever it releases. So keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah, for sure. And uh, we're going to get into a few really cool plants and a few of our favorite stories about maples and other plants as well, not just maples. Uh, this actually is one of the largest trees we know of of a Japanese maple. I've seen a taller tree, but I've never seen a tree with a bigger uh, diameter. So the, uh, the base of this tree um, is a 13.6. We measure? I can hide behind it like this, believe it or not, and you can't see me. So. A 13 foot 6 circumference, a 4 foot, I think it's 13 foot 6, ended up being a, a 4 foot 3 uh, diameter. So, so this is at the Hopewood Estate there in Flat Rock. It's about five minutes from our home. This is the, uh, the North American Maple Society when they were touring Nashville. We brought them by. Uh, I've seen many trees that had more height, but never more width. So if you're into big tree hunter kind of stuff and you like seeing the giant ones, this one's one of the champions I've ever seen in. I've never seen a bigger base to a Japanese maple in um, some of the older Westenberg plantings or even in, in Japan, I've never seen one with a bigger base. And while a lot of trees have stories that we're talking to that have cultivars, this one tree was actually planted in the uh, early, early 1900s as a large tree. So one of the things we get asked most commonly are like, oh, your degree must be in like uh, horticulture, correct? And I'm like, my degree's in history. <laughs> so uh, one of the things we like to approach Japanese maples from are the stories. Like we like to approach it, Tim and I both have always had a love for history and, and just storytelling. And so one of the things we like to look at, you know, why is this important, who made it important? And like, what's the story behind that? So uh, we've done a lot of different collections and weird things. Like we'll do a Go Wild collection where we'll talk about, um, you know, Tony or uh, Tony Ello even, or uh, Mark Weatherington going and doing some wild collecting of some rare and interesting stuff. Uh, in China and, and the story behind that is interesting it may be hard for somebody to get behind having uh, Acer pseudosmoldianum subspecies Taka Semense in their garden but when they hear that story about what they did when they were looking for these things and it, why you know it relates it to us and it makes it human yeah. and it makes it uh, it brings the human element into the plants and so that's something we love to look into or you know why who what where when and why about each plant too so, so if you aren't already uh, subscribed to our Tenant 10, you can go to mrmaple.com. It'll say subscribe for our newsletter. You can type in your email. And every Tuesday at uh, 10 a.m., we've been doing this for a little bit over a year now, we put 10 new trees on our website directly at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. And so if you sign on that, you'll get the email. We try to send it out about 9.30. There's some technical I issues that make it out about 10. Um, we'd like to say, you probably heard me say this before, but we'd like to say it was just really smart marketing. but around about a month ago, a year and a month ago, like we need to put 300 trees on the website. I said, gosh, I can't write 300 descriptions, that's a book. So I'm not doing that this week. And Tim's like, I'm not doing that this week. And so we said, why don't we use 10? And so that turned into, we're gonna do 10 this week. Why don't we just do 10 at Tuesday? And then it all just turned into 10 at 10 on Tuesdays. So, so now basically every single week, it's not all maples. We'll put a lot of interesting plants in there and we try to mix it up a little bit and pick things that kind of play off each other so that they're kind of complimentary, but it's a it's a fun way if you like uh, gardening blogs. It's kind of an example of that, but in an email form. So Japanese maples, well, a lot of their stories started out. There's some uh, stories about Japanese maples as early as uh, the eighth century uh, A.D. and on Japanese maples in Japan. But a lot of the cultivars, the very first cultivar selections 
start out in 1710 on some of the oldest Japanese literature. So we actually have a customer who only collects trees from the 1710. Wouldn't recommend that. That's a small collection. You need more. But a really cool way to do it because he has this garden that's only trees from that 1710 list. And we work with him on Translate a little bit more of that too. I believe there's 36 on the original list. And with each of the original list, there's a, a Japanese haiku that actually goes with each tree. Mm. Now, we, we're actually in the process of actually finding all the literature on that so we can get all the haikus translated, which I think would be... Uh, mm really exciting and maybe a future talk in the future. So even that far back, people are focusing on the story behind every tree. So every tree literally has, you know, poetry that it's, you know, that level of art form gifted to it. So it's like, this is such a beautiful piece of art that deserves this poetry with it as well. And this is one of the trees from the original list uh, listed, the very first cultivars ever on record of Japanese maples. This is the Shigetatsu Sawa. It sounds almost like a little bit of a mouthful to say, but this is a really beautiful uh, four to five foot upright Japanese maple with a little bit of a spreading habit to it. Green reticulated variegation. This is actually a photo I took at the Arboretum. You can actually see this tree in the corner. I took it uh, during the Ralston Blooms event before the, before the event around, I took some photos of my phone. <coughs> beautiful tree for that etching. You know, a lot of people call it ghost series top red reticulation now, but what it's actually, you know, reticulatum style variegation is what that's more commonly known as. And as you can see, it just kind of that etching throughout each leaf. And here's the little uh, poem that's translated into uh, kanji, or uh, uh, romanji. romanji, right here. And then here it is into English. Even to me, an uncultivated soul, sadness is felt when snipes fly up from a marsh in the autumn evening. And that, that's what they were seeing when they saw this tree. They selected it, and then it became Shigatsu Sawa, which is... Snaps fly up from the marsh in the autumn evening. <laughs> and so you'll see that on a ton of really cool maples, a lot of those earlier trees have this poetry and this kind of little story that tags along with the plant. And it's just an interesting way. It's a, it's a fun way to think about gardening too. And so there's a few other trees that we do that are on uh, from that list. Uh, they're still in cultivation today. I don't have all the poetry with, uh, from a lot of those, but that is something that we're looking into. We're actually making a trip to study, uh, possibly study some of uh, J.D. Veritree's research, which I'm hoping includes uh, that list. So Shishigashira, uh, often referred to as Lion's Head, you've seen this one everywhere as, hey, this is Lion's Head. Not specifically Lion's Head, I mean, that would refer to a specific character. Um, and Shishi is a, the female lion. And so Shishigashira basically means the female lion's head. And so there's obviously that little poem that goes along with this as well. But this is a cultivar that dates back years and years, 1710 at least. And here's actually a photo of it at Tsukasa Maple in Japan. It's in many gardens today. It's actually out here in the, the J.C. Rouston as well. Lovely tree. And so like to say this means lion's head would be like, you know, to dumb it down to the lowest level, would be like, that'd be like saying mouse head was Mickey Mouse. Like it's a character of a specific thing that ties into a specific poem though. So it is a specific character. So even back then, again, tying into everything to a story. And this is a tree that if you grow it in the uh, full sun, it's going to end up being about a six to eight foot tree in 10 to 15 years. Uh, if you grow it in the shade, it can actually grow a little bit taller and a little bit narrower. It's green, and then it also goes to the yellows to oranges in the fall. And that tight, clustered foliage and that crinkled habit is supposed to look more like a lion's mane. And that's where it gets that name of that shishi gashira. If you've ever been to one of our talks too, we talk a lot about sizes. Um, we always talk about sizes in a reference to a 15 year period. And one of the reasons we do that is because a lot of places will say, at maturity, this is this big. And I'll have people that like to walk around and fact check me at the nursery and they'll say, how big does this one get? Well, this website says it gets six feet at maturity. And I'm like, well, here's a three gallon, I'm six two. It's, it's kind of already there at maturity. I guess maturity for that one was two years or three years because that's where it's at. And so like at maturity can be a vague term for Japanese maples because we're dealing with a plant that can easily live over, to be over hundred years old. And so what we try to say is, and with this kind of time frame, this is kind of what you should expect in Japanese maple growth, because a healthy, happy Japanese maple is going to outlive all of us. And a lot of those people you find online are going by the book on Japanese maples, and the reference point for the book on Japanese maples is ultimate height is the biggest one we've ever seen, which... Peter's a great friend of mine. He'll say the biggest one he's ever seen, that's how big it gets. And I'm like, well, I have a, have a two-year-old, and now I have a, uh, as of yesterday, I have a four-month-old. And I'm like, they're never going to see 150 year age size trees. So to say this gets 12 by 12 doesn't really make any sense in her gardening lifetime that's never going to be achieved. And so what we try to do is give a, a good time frame for what you should expect.
And what that type of framing ha happens to do is it makes all the new cultivars dwarfs and all the old cultivars giants. And, that, uh, and you put them in the same time frame, they often have the same growth rate. Yeah, so if you look at anything that's been around 40 years, well, we've seen a 40-year-old you know, one. Well, that's, that, gosh, that gets real big. That's a large one. But it's all relative to growth rate, really. And so Tukiyama was one of the very first ones on that 1710 list. And happens to be that it was introduced by Kobayashi Momiji N. And they're in Saitama in Japan, and we had the privilege of going and visiting them. One of the coolest things we had to go and visit this nursery, uh, like I said, it's been, Tim said, it's been around. Uh, the, the grandson was there, and if he took over the nursery, I believe he would have been the 29th consecutive generation at that nursery. Um, just an amazing thing to see. We got to go there and, and kind of tour their gardens, and it was just one of the coolest things to get to, to see something that's been. And if you go back in that family far enough, they've introduced so many uh, popular Japanese maple cultivars that you would know, but. One of their earliest stars was the Tamukiyama set. <laughs> Does anyone here have Tamukiyama in their garden? It's a very popular tree. Uh, Tamukiyama is one of those trees that holds its color extremely well. It uh, leaves out two weeks later, avoids the layers that are frost. Hmm. And it's a, a moderate uh, to vigorous dwarf weeping lace leaf Japanese maple. Typically this one's going to be like five by six, so five feet tall, about six feet wide in a 15 year period. Now, one thing we always throw out there too, growth can change per area. It's like a lovely garden down at Stephen F. Austin, but they get three months of dormancy and the rest of the year in growth. growth. So they certainly can get bigger depending on the dormancy period. But uh, one, of the, one of the classic Japanese maples and uh, one that's been around for a while there at Kobayashi Momiji Inn. Uh, it's actually not on the 1700s list, but right after that, I believe they put that, they selected this one. And this one, uh, there's a couple different translations of what this name means. One of the names means, uh, translations, is hands folded in a prayer on a mountain. And the other one is tribute to the mountain, which is uh, pretty neat and awesome. And uh, this is actually a Jiro Kobayashi. He's the grandfather uh, at the nursery now, the, the oldest uh, at the nursery. So many of you probably have seen Taka. Gosh, the first time we got to meet Taka, um, we were here and uh, we actually came and heard him speak in this room and Mark took us out to dinner with Taka afterward and just such a cool experience never thought we'd be visiting Taka and, and friends with him like we are now and uh, so Taka's nursery is actually across the street his last name's Kobayashi as well but they're not related and Taka was like they're not gonna be super friendly but you're gonna love going to this nursery so don't be offended if you go to this nursery and no one's super friendly that's just the way it is but don't be offended you're getting to go to a 300 year old nursery just smile and, and say thank you and so we said, we got it, we'll be super friendly, uh, no worries. But we got there and um, we exchanged gifts and, and Jiro comes running off the porch, which he's the elder statesman of the family. You normally don't get to meet him. You'd normally meet the two generations below him that are there. And uh, Taka, after talking with Taka for about five minutes, Taka's basically just like, why the heck do you like these guys? <laughs> like, well, what's going on? You're, you're normally not, you don't really want to talk to these guys, do you? What's going on? And he said, I've been on their website. They had really nice things to say about me. So that's the small world we live in now with, uh, with gardening technology. It's 300-year-old nursery. And uh, Jiro, who's in his 90s, had been on our website. So we were, we were honored. That was, we felt pretty cool that he knew who we were ahead of time. But that's why it pays to say nice things about people on your website. If we had a good end then. So. And every time we've been back, it's been so friendly and nice. And uh, this is Jiro. And he's standing in front of Jiro Shidari. His dad, when he was six weeks old, named this tree after him, mm -hmm. which is, is crazy. And we got to meet Jiro now, who's 92, and you just start to see how much of a legacy this nursery has been throughout. Many of you have probably grown Ryusin in your garden too. That's actually a tree that's in this garden, and Ryusin is a seedling from Jiro Shidari. Mm -hmm. So Jiro gets a little wider as his habit. It's gonna grow more like that Tamukiyama. As his natural habit, it's a little bit more wider than it is tall, where the seedling Ryusin from it's kind of straight down. And this is one of the grandsons. His son was running around the nursery too, uh, but right up here, you see, this is actually a top grafted Ryusin. So they took an old tree that was in the nursery, and it was probably an, any other type. And they just, since Ryusin is their most popular tree right now, they top grafted all across that tree so they'd have a big prime specimen at the very front of their nursery. His son would be the uh, 29th generation, I believe, if he takes it over. Mm -hmm. Really cool thing to see. But Ryusin's, uh, Ryusin is an improvement on Jiro Shidari. Uh, Jiro Shidari is that cascading weeping style with lots of twisting contorting habit. Ryusin is more heat tolerant, faster growing, 
trains really well in the stake, so you can stake it up <coughs> as high as you want it. I didn't put any, include any photos of this, but they've, we're using them as topsy turvies, growing them upside down, letting them go straight down and, and out the bottom of a pot. Actually, in this picture where I'm at, if you were over here looking in this area at the nursery, there's like a big hanging basket section and they have Ryusin growing directly out of the bottom of these clay pots. Cool. And what they were doing is they were putting the annuals on top of those pots, mm -hmm. growing Ryusin unstaked. And so it grows downward for about three years, cracking the pot, planting that, and then unstaked, sweeping back down the other way. So it makes some really cool shapes. I've tried this at our nursery. I wouldn't I recommend hanging it above the watering system. Did that for the winter. It didn't work out so great for me to hang that bad boy from the top of the, the greenhouse when you're uh, when your drop down water is 18 inches and your pot's not quite there, that doesn't really work out so good for them over the winter, but... But you learn from your mistakes just like you learn from your going. <laughs> it's kind of interesting though, when we've, we've done it a few times. We had one in our display garden for a little while at my uncle's place and we eventually planted it. Uh, we did that with its Mukiyama. And what's interesting is in about two days all the foliage rotates over. So we started it out as a young graft upside down and all the foliage just goes like... Mm. And so eventually you have a, an upside down tree in, in a matter of like a day. And so what is believed to be the lineage of these trees is Naka Komodo weeping. We got to go visit this tree. This tree is the oldest recorded Japanese maple still alive today. So if you've been to any of our talks, we throw this in every single talk. So you've seen a picture of this one. This is Naka Komodo weeping. Um, this uh, it was listed right at 600 years old. Um, we were shooting the episode of Nipo Uh We were literally uh, in here doing the 40 years of the J.C. Ralston speech and we got out of there and we checked our email and it said you're confirmed to be on Nippo Nikitai which is essentially who wants to go to Japan and while we were there filming this this episode we were uh, up in the Fukushima prefecture kind of near where some of the tsunamis and things happened and we were visiting uh, a friend of ours nursery they were shooting at and they said we're going to shoot b-roll today so you guys can just kind of hang out and uh, so we really weren't doing anything anyway in the rain and we uh, commandeered Nakata-san, he was kind enough to drive us. So we were looking at their brochure and translating it and it said, less than an hour from the national treasure tree of Japan. And so we're like, well, we've got a, I had a, I had a hunch that was a Japanese maple that I'd looked at before, but that's exactly what this was, the uh, Naka Komodo weeping. It's just awe-inspiring to stand next to something that old too. Uh, we'll actually need to get our video out on it, but I had my friend who was our translator with us translate literally every piece of information that we could find on this tree around it. And the stakes that are on the tree actually have dates on that say those stakes that are holding those branches up are right around 200 years old as well. So pretty cool. You stand next to something that's 600 years old and you think like, wow, like the changes the world's even seen in the time frame that this has been in the ground as a living tree. And pretty so, cool. So this tree actually sits right here. There's a temple right here. And there's actually some sister seedlings that have been uh, seedlings off of it. They're trying to promote the lineage just in case one day this tree doesn't make it because this is the oldest uh, tree that they want to be able to perpetuate that lineage of this tree. I mean, that was just all inspiring to see. And so, the there's a lot of history behind those plants, and a lot of the trees that you came from, that, that that are in the gardens out here and in your gardens, all came from Kobayashi Mimiji in over 300 years. I mean, that that kind of story, that kind of history in one nursery is just amazing. I couldn't even imagine anything in the United States. Uh, one nursery lasting for 300 years. I mean, our, our country is barely not even 300 years old yet. Um, so one of the cool things, we were, when we were going to Japan, we were wanting to go see Tsukasa Maple mm -hmm. Nursery. And the very first year, time we went to Japan, it's been about five years ago now, we booked a plane and we were literally walking on the plane. This was before the TV show. And uh, Yanata Tanaka, who was there, emailed us and said, guys, I'm sorry, I can't meet with you this time. And he's the owner of Tsukasa Maple Nursery. And we were just heartbroken because he was one of the, the main things we wanted to go to see. And we got to go to World Maple Park and walk around with Masio Yano, who's written a few books. Um, and uh, Yano's good friends, he owns uh, World Maple Park. He's kind of the director of World Maple Park there in Japan. And um, we said, gosh, we'd really like to go see um, Tsukasa Maple, but he canceled on us last second. He said, no, 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 he doesn't want to cancel on you. The point was, if it didn't have a translator and he wasn't able to talk to you, it wouldn't be worth your time. He, he would really like to talk to you, but he didn't have a translator. And I said, well, do you think you could message him for me and say if we provided a translator, would it be possible uh, for us to go and visit him? Because we'd already given up on this. This was about four days, five days into our trip. We were there about 18 days, and we'd already made plans and said, oh, we're heartbroken because that's one of the places we really got to see. And he said, of course, he'd love to meet with you if you can provide a translator. 
So we commandeered Taka that day too. We we got him to go with us over there. Luckily, he just got back from South Korea early. They yeah, was, they weren't even going to be able to see us on this trip, but he got back from there early and was able to go and be a translator for us, which is nice. Now we have a lot of friends in uh, the Saitama region, which we can. Uh, One of the coolest acquire. things about that trip was getting to sit down with this man and talk to him about some of the stories behind some of the trees that he was growing and some of the things that are almost lost in translation to us a little bit in the United States. And so there's a lot of interesting, awesome trees he's introduced and the stories are completely speculation a lot of times. And, and the most of them are completely wrong, to be honest with you. And so he was so gracious when we actually got there, he probably sat down with us for two hours. And, and what, he, had a, what he would do is he would come out on this board, write the, the uh, katakana or hiragana out and then translate it on there what each of the things mean because he can actually write English and so he would sit there and say this means white snow dancer and it was it one of those things where you're like wow this is really 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 exciting and so unless you knew the kanji um, you know explained a whole different aspect of the tree that you wouldn't get just from the Ramanji at all either so if you looked at the Ramanji which is just phonically how something sounded um, you know Ramanji's terrible for the most part Barry Inger can help us clean it up a lot, but for the most part, it doesn't doesn't always make the most sense because what's becomes uh, the norm, what's printed, and what's uh, out there in literature typically becomes the accepted way to do it, whether it sounded phonically and the way a Japanese nursery may have said it or not. And just like here in the United States, in different parts of Japan, people have different pronunciations, and so the pronunciation on how their dialect is said comes out in the Romanji, and so. It, it can really throw off exactly what you're looking for. So whenever we get out there, this is actually another trip there. Um, we always sit down with him and he, he kind of spells out some of the stories about different trees for us. And very interestingly, by seeing the kanji of it, it often changes the meaning of what you thought it was. And so this is Hanamatoi. It's a tree that has sort of been thrown on the scene that people really love. It's a weeping red lace leaf with pink and white variegation. It has that cascading umbrella habit and that now we, we got this tree and we said, okay, so what does Hanamatoi mean? And so Matt asked uh, someone that was, he was taking a, a small community college Japanese course. And she, All I learned was I really knew nothing <laughs> through that course, but. She said, Hanamatoi, that may, almost sounds like when people say you're a flower of a person, it's like a compliment. And so that's meaning flower. Yeah, so that's what we were thinking. When we sat down with uh, Yonata Tanaka, <coughs> we actually got a, a quite a, a different story. So the Ito period, I believe it was, or maybe it was right before the Ito period, Ito period. really big in Japan, you know, that, that's one of the most idolized time frames of heroism and things like that. And the firefighters are among some of the most revered people during that time frame because you're in the, uh, the Ito period in Japan, fire is one of your biggest threats. And so firemen are like the coolest people on the planet. And what they carry around are these things called a matoi. And that's what those things are on the stake. And so it's a flower matoi. And so these are big things that the, the firefighters would run in with. And uh, it, it's just a, a very respectful way to remember that part of the history. And so completely different perspective on the description and, and the, the experience behind that plant. And so what he explained to us was that these firemen are revered to them almost like samurai, like the, the people who were the, the superheroes of the time. And this Matoi just has those long draping habit to it, just like the Hanamatoi. Uh, and so that's what that tree is going to do too. It's of course a cascading umbrella shape similar to like that Tamukiyama shape, but with bright pinks over top of that. Now if you're growing it in a little bit more sun, you're going to get bright pink on red. If you put this one in heavy shade, it's still quite pretty, but it's actually quite different. It's going to be white and light pink and green in heavy shade. So it's still very beautiful, but quite different. So you'll get more shades of green in there and, and heavy shade. So he was looking through a bunch of different ceilings that he was growing out, and he found one that was just growing tall and narrow. And so that really struck out to Yonata Tanaka, and he started growing it for a while, and he's like, I really like this plant, and he was thinking about introducing it, and he gave one uh, to Don Shadow, and Don Shadow really liked it, and he said, Don, why don't you put a name on this? And so he named it, Don Shadow actually named it Sukasa, which is the name of Yonata Tanaka's nursery. It was actually Yonata Tanaka's father's name. Because it, it, again, is a generational nursery that's been passed down. One thing that's kind of cool, too, as you'll see, is a lot of times it's Sukasa Maple, but the maple's in English, like M-A-P-L-E, instead of Sukasa Mamiji. It's just kind of fun to see, like, people that like the, you know, people get Japanese tattoos, and it's, it's reciprocated because, like, a lot of things are really cool. Like, I guess one of the cooler things about the nursery for, over there is that it's in English, too, so it's Sukasa Maple. But this is a tree 
that he has come in, he has came in here and trimmed this tree up in June or July, and it's made it extra narrow. But Sukkot Silhouette does make a more narrow form. If you grow one out, often it will be a tree that will be 15 to 20 feet tall, 6 to 8 foot wide. Much more narrow than Very the species. thin, narrow footprint in the garden. Uh, one of the most talked about things, I've got to get me some of these shoes whenever, whenever I post this one on uh, Facebook or Instagram, everybody's like, i got to get me some of those boots. So those, those toad boots probably get as uh, much attention as the, uh, the tree. But uh, yeah, that, that was just us there with him. It was just such a fun experience. Every time we've been, we go and, and visit uh, him, and it, the stories are as equally as interesting as, as, as the plants to us, because he always kind of just dives into the history and then the why it was named also. And so this is actually a tree that he's using out in the streets in Japan because it's extremely hardy. It can handle full sun, and if it has a shallow non-invasive root system, so it's a great street tree to fit in small spaces. But it goes to fire engine red in the fall. Um, I think one of the reasons he liked us too is that Mr. Maple is a nickname they called my dad, and so our nursery kind of comes from my dad's hobby. Well, Sukasa is his father as well, so his father uh, kind of had that lineage with him as well. So kind of a neat little connection there we shared. So this is a really fun tree that we're uh, we having come on the market sometime very soon. We got grafted. This is a weeping Japanese maple. But the difference is between this and like a Ryusen is this one has large leaves, almost like an Osaka Zuki. Huge but, foliage, really cool. I mean, it's going to be like kind of this size frame on this size tree here. Um, and, and the fall color is more yellows with a little bit of orange instead of on the red side. Very, very bright yellow too. It's a really showy large leaf with like an electric yellow fall color. And equally as pendulous as the uh, Ryusin, so it's going to be that extremely weep. And one of those trees, again, that gets about as tall as you, as you stake it. And this tree was a really old, revered Japanese maple that sat at a temple. And no one was supposed to quite propagate it, but a few nurserymen propagated it. And then, unfortunately, tsunami hit. Took that Japanese maple out. But thankfully now, since people had propagated it, that now there's Japanese, that Japanese maple is going back to that temple. And it's actually making its way into the nursery trade as well, which is uh, pretty fun and exciting. Really cool tree, though. Um, kind of similar to the Ryusin again, but much bigger leaf, and then really bright, bright yellow fall colors, too. Yeah. That's next to, next to the original graft of that Rakuzen Shidari there in Japan. And we may be offering this one in next spring to Maybe summer? fall. Maybe See, fall to spring. So this is a trident maple. Trident maples are fun plants, extremely tough, durable. They get a little bit of exfoliating bark to them as they age. A little more invasive root system than a Japanese maple, but really quick growing. And so they make a lot a, a tree that can make a, a shade tree fairly quickly. Super tough too. That's one of the reasons they're so popular for bonsai is the, uh, the really durableness uh, of the trident maple. Uh, Waco Nishki is a really fun one we grow. Uh, leaves out with this bright, bright white. So people ask if this is a real picture. This is actually a cell phone picture I took of the uh, three gallon. I think we sold this specific tree <laughs> this spring. They were quite popular. Uh, always in the spring, these are like gone in no time. One of the neat things about this tree is in Japan, they love this plant, right? They, they thought this tree was amazing. It's so white. This tree is super, super white. But they were afraid it was so white that it wouldn't survive on its own because a lot of plants that have so much white to them don't get enough chlorophyll to survive. So what they would do is they'd leave the rootstock sticking up on it. And so they'd keep this little ball trim back that was green trying to feed the plant to keep it super, super white. And while that did keep this tree whiter throughout the season, and it was a fun way to make that plant whiter throughout the season, it really wasn't until this tree really got into the United States that it really, people started trimming off that rootstock and realizing it would actually still survive. And so as a result, what this tree does is it leaves that white in the spring. When summer comes in, chlorophyll starts coming into the leaf. So it goes green during the summer. And then goes, this one actually goes uh, to reds in the fall. Brilliantly red in the fall. One of the fun things, we've actually seen people produce similar type, very white uh, plants like that in Japan. And they'll even put the, the rootstock on the other side of the fence. And so there's this piece over here feeding, you know, this neon pink or this neon white. Um, and, and you don't see that part of the plant, but all this over here is just a support. So the extent we go to is gardeners, right? But this this bright white or bright pink is sustained by this uh, green that's behind the fence that's bringing the chlorophyll into the rest of the plant. And so here we're, we were in Japan, and now we're going to travel to Australia. And Arnold Tees, AJ Tees, uh, at uh, Yamina Rare Plant Nursery in Australia, he was actually uh, visiting Kunara Springs restaurant. He was, uh, it's restaurant and gardens, and he was sitting down outside, 
and was having himself a dinner and looked up and saw a dwarf mutation, a witch's broom, growing in a green Japanese maple there. And it was at Kunara Springs restaurant, and he was like, wow, this is awesome. He got, got a piece from it, grafted it, and it became Kunara Pygmy. So now, a lot of his interesting introductions have actually made it to the trade. Uh, the same nursery introduced peaches and cream, which you're definitely familiar with, and fairy lights. Um, Kunara Pygmy is another one of their classics. All he's going to have is more of that dwarf habit to it. So by grafting that broom on the tree, it dwarfs that down. That genetic mutation is going to be smaller. And so by grafting that, we get the similar traits to the parent plant, but in a much smaller palette. And a lot of people in plants call that a witch's broom. I have some friends that call it a blessing, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> because instead of something that had been cursed over time, it's something that people see as a, a, a big positive. Because you can take a cutting from a witch's broom, graft it, and then you've got a dwarf plant that can be a little more manageable and fit in a smaller landscape. You've heard us say this in every one of our talks, we've been there before, but it often looks like almost like a little squirrel's nest in the tree, so it just looks like a little ball. And uh, gosh, we've, we've actually bring that up in a lot of our talks and people find them, they're like, I have that in my garden. And uh, we've, we've even talked, you, know, you speak it up places, you end up speaking at someone's home eventually, and they said, there's one out in the yard, come on out here. So we spoke to a garden club that was quite big at a home, and then we said, uh, if you see this mutation in the garden, let us know. And we walked outside and there it was. And so we're gonna move to Holland to Esfeld Nursery. This is one of the most primo maple spots in uh, the world when it comes to Japanese maples. Yeah, this is our friend Cor Van Gelderen and his father up there, D.M. Van Gelderen. Uh, D.M. Van Gelderen, also a very famous author of uh, Japanese maple books as well. And Cor, for my money, is one of the most knowledgeable people you'll ever meet. Uh, really fun thing, here's a picture with uh, Peter Gregory who wrote the fourth edition of uh, J.D. Vertree's book too. He did the third and fourth edition as well as the handbook. And so just a real, it was a real fun thing to be there and see two authors too who had different books on maples together. But whenever I go to a, a tour, and, and actually a uh, little sneak preview, the International Maple Society meeting is going to be here next year. So the 2020 Maple Society meeting, every three years it's an international meeting. And so we're working on, uh, we've been talking a lot with Mark, and we're going to have some of the international folks go home over. So maybe uh, you'll get to meet Cor, but he's one of the most knowledgeable people. Whenever I go to a garden, he typically skips the tour and walks around, and that's the tour I take. I'm like, wherever he's going, <laughs> that's where I want to go, because those stories are the best parts. And it, it's quite striking, but hey, uh, shout out to Maple Society. If you're interested in maples, uh, the Maple Society is a great group of people. Uh, the meeting this year, the registration is just about to be going out and be posted online very soon. We post it on Facebook pages. Members will get it in their mail and email uh, this week. Um, it's going to be in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. And so we'll be traveling from uh, speakers we have are Talon Buckle, so he's going to be speaking on his new introductions. We have uh, Sadafumi Uchiyama from the Portland Japanese Gardens. He's going to be speaking on Japanese gardening. Uh, Paul Halladin from Isley Nursery is going to be speaking on their Jack Frost series. They're hybrids with Pseudosibuldianum. Um, Augustin Coelho. Uh, Augustin Coelho Vera is going to be talking about the new class, one of the new classifications of, Jap of maples and how they are classified. Um, Martin Nicholson's coming from the Hoyt Arboretum, talking a little bit about some of their collections. Really fun setup of speakers, though. I mean, it's, yep. there's a couple others, too, I think we're adding in. And we'll be touring uh, Dancing Oaks Nursery, Whitman Farms, Buck Holtz Nursery, and the Portland Japanese Gardens, and Don Schmidt Nursery. And then so the next year uh, will be the international meeting. Every three years we have an international meeting uh, with the, uh, the, the branch in Europe. And so all those folks will be coming here to uh, the J.C. Ralston. So we'll be hosting that here. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a lot of fun opportunities. We're, we're hoping to get some really premier speakers, too. And we're working with Mark to get some benefits for members, too, for that, too. So, so as Cord tells it, his nursery started, uh, he says, because of pirates. Yeah, there's the original uh, Acer uh, Shirasawanum Arium is at this nursery. It's, uh, it's very old. I think it's over 200 years old, that tree. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, if you steal something today, I can't be too mad at you because Seabold sailed up here on a ship and threw this tree to my great-grandfather and said, here, have this. And it was something that he had illegally taken from wherever he had gotten it before in Japan. And so, and so that tree is really one of the things that really piqued their interest and got them into their maple collection. So it starts back with Seabold, who, as he says, went and uh, basically was helping the Japanese on this side while loading a ship full of rare plants as you may see, as the story goes on Seabold, he was an optometrist, and so he would go around and help people 
uh, get glasses and eye exams and things like that. We'll all while similar to that. Yeah, and all while pirating as many Japanese maples that he could. That's why we have Acer Seaboldianum and Acer Pseudo Seaboldianum named after Seabold because he was the first one to bring those back to Holland, and some of those original ones are planted there in Bosco. And so, as any story goes, some stories get embellished and changed over time. And as you may have read in our description of Ariadne, I go in and I'm like, do a research on this tree, and I'm like, Ariadne, this is a tree, you know, it was named after the Greek goddess of the maze. Ariadne. It's etching to it. It's got to have something to do with that, right? Ariadne is a Greek goddess to. of the maze. Mm -hmm. Right? Reticulated veins, every little vein and, has a maze to it. And so my, my description says, named after the goddess of the maze, if you look at this, you'll get lost in all the colors. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. Has Greatest ridiculous. description ever, right? He just had the poetry to it. And so I'm sitting there talking to Corey at dinner one uh, time of the international meetings, and I was like, so Corey, Ariadne, named after the Greek goddess of the maze, right? He said, named it after my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then so he has, his son is Reuben, another one of his introductions. You go down the list, Ellen, you start going out. It's really fun to meet his family because I'm like, I have your tree, I have your tree, I have your tree. <laughs> What's your name? I don't have your tree, I got your tree. And so it's, it's one of those things where that family's been introducing trees for over 100 years. But Ariadne has this amazing spring color, it does green up here in the south during the summer, goes to red in the fall. Kind of gets these purplish hues throughout it, kind of has a two-tone appearance to it. Yeah, and basically about an eight to 10 footer, giving it a little protection from the hot afternoon sun but a really, really beautiful tree. You'll find some of those, uh, some of those that, that was a small leap. I've seen some big leaps. So another friend of ours that had a nursery, had a, a mill or business has since retired, and you would see descriptions that, let's say, embellished even longer on the legends and things like that. And so they would say, this tree comes from the famous skiing family of Switzerland, and that's why it's named this. And then I met the guy who named it. He was like, oh, I just like the name. I didn't have anything. I've never been to Switzerland. <laughs> and so like some of those stories tend to get a little uh, exaggerated over time and, and, and become legends and expanded on. But So we always like to try to go visit people who introduce them and figure out the story directly. Uh, One probably. of our big things, too, is we're just big plant geeks, obviously. And so we like to go to the original whenever possible and source our material back to that very first tree. And so that we know there's no mistake between us and that first Ariadne if we can. So Esfeld Nursery, that nursery in Europe with this history from Seabold and everything, uh, Cor is a renowned plantsman. And this is a plant that I love quite a bit. It's actually a Japanese maple. But wait, it doesn't look like a Japanese maple. It looks like a hornbeam. Well, it's actually a Japanese hornbeam maple, an Acer carpinifolium. Mm. And Cor this found is a, a selection of that with a really tight, compact habit. So all the growth is really, really tight and kind of a bit more narrow, but it's also very full of bushy. And Corin Diem found this as a, a dwarf witch's broom growing in a hornbeam maple. They took it out, grafted it, and then they've got this dwarf hornbeam maple that doesn't get very big, but at the same time has this serrated edging. And it's tight, dense, com compact habit, goes to red in the fall, really good fall color. Everything you're looking for in a Japanese maple, but it's not your typical Japanese maple that you think about. Because most of the time when people think about Japanese maples, we think about palmatums, surasolums, <coughs> japonicums. But the term Japanese maple can actually be termed for plants that are maples that come from Japan. <laughs> and so there's a number of other snake bark maples and hornbeam maples and a lot of uh, pictums and, uh, that are in Japan and from Japan, but aren't what you typically think of as a Japanese maple. Really fun stump plant too. Villa Toronto, uh, this was named after a garden in Italy, uh, Villa Toronto Gardens. Uh, Cor Van Gelderen, our friend we were just talking about, was. Uh, touring there and had, had a little break and went to the garden and actually found this selection there. He was actually doing a gardening talk. And so he's like, I had a few free minutes, so I went to the Villa Toronto Gardens. And saw this seedling there. Kind of a cool little thing, uh, last year Hendersonville, we're, Hendersonville, North Carolina is basically home for us. We're East Flat Rock, which when people ask where we're at, we say Hendersonville because no one knows where East Flat Rock is. Their sister city is right beside Villa Toronto. And so the uh, the mayor of uh, Karanke, yeah. I'm saying the Japanese name, I can't really I, it, it sounds like that. Uh, anyway, he, he was visiting, and he's literally very, very close to the Little Toronto Gardens. And so the mayor was visiting last year and came to tour our nursery. And it was really cool. We were going around the gardens there at my uncle's place here, but there there was a big Little Toronto in the garden. And so, of course, we had to ask, do you know where this garden's at in Italy? And it was literally right next door to him. So. But the seedling sitting beside this was Red Pygmy. And so Cor named uh, Red Pygmy and Villa Toronto. And Villa Toronto was a, a good size and the Villa uh, Red Pygmy was much smaller and denser. And he, so he named it Red Pygmy. And then as Cora told me, 
Later on, he found out that red pygmy wasn't so pygmy after all. It actually grew quite a bit. <laughs> but it kept the name popular red for leafing out with that kind of uh, blushing effect where it's got greener older growth. With the, you see that one has kind of bright pink tones over top of that, and then this being kind of a reddish brick fall color. One of the unique things about Villa Toronto as a tree is it really branches outwards. It really makes a V-shape almost every time. And so it, with some sunlight, it can really uh, make out and go <coughs> more shaped like this. Making uh, animals. Oh. <laughs> well, it makes a nice V-shape, which is quite interesting and very unique for... Uh, a learner lobum style. Yeah, for sure. Peve starfish. So you'll see this uh, a lot, Peve, and people ask, what's the Peve stand for? People say, I'd like to get a PV, I'd like to get a... You know, we get a bunch of different questions about how to pronounce this. Another interesting selection from Holland, uh, Piet Vergelt is where that name comes from. So he puts his little signature on every one of his introductions. Many of you probably grow... Um, a Peve minaret in your gardens, uh, the, the uh, bald cypress that's a dwarf. And so this is actually a selection Relative. that Piet Drugelt found, but our friend Talon Buckholz was visiting him from Oregon. We'll talk about Talon here in a minute, some of his introductions. But he was visiting him and said, hey, that looks like a starfish. And Piet heard that and said, huh. He said, I'll name it Peve starfish. And it's funny because Talon later named a plant starfish, not knowing that his friend was naming uh, this tree here, starfish. A really nice curling habit to it. I first saw this one in Holland and just fell in love with the shape. Um, we do a lot of talks about how to get kids into gardening. If you ever want to get a kid into gardening, just show them a critter, like a, in the name, like starfish. They're, every time a kid's going to come back to the garden and go, how's the starfish doing? And so that's one that always draws them in for sure. But typically about a six to eight footer, just that cut down foliage just makes a really unique texture in the garden. It uh, goes to a brighter red in the fall. Uh, real fun plant for sure. On the left here, this is actually Tyn Vergelt, Piet's uh, son. He came to visit us uh, this past uh, winter, and uh, it was kind of funny because we were in a garden where a bear had a huge garden. I had a customer of ours that has over probably about four to five hundred Japanese maples in the ground, lots of a large conifer collection. We were showing them around, and every Peve introduction, the bear attacked. The bear attacked <laughs> from. Peve minaret to Peve multicolor, the Japanese maple, it didn't make any sense. It only attacked the Peve, every Peve. So every Vergelt introduction got attacked. Mm -hmm. And we said, Tyne, you better be careful. We're lucky to get out of here. We were introduced them to the, uh, the owner of the garden. After the owner of the garden had explained all the Peves got destroyed by the bear, and then we introduced them, and he said, what's your name? Oh, Ver Peve. Yeah, okay. So uh, you're lucky to get out of here without the bear attacking. So these other gentlemen, the, uh, the guy in the very back is our friend, um, Hank been camping. Uh, we actually met Hank for the first time in this garden. Uh, kind of a cool thing. Uh, that's the power of Facebook. We were walking around this garden and we're actually at the Sherman's Nordlick over here in the garden getting trimmings a few years ago. And uh, here comes Hank down the aisle and I'm like, I know you. Uh, we're friends on Facebook and you have a nursery in Holland. And he said, yes. And I named this tree that you're trimming on currently. So we were standing <laughs> over there, met you know, a small world when you're, when you're into gardening. But here we were, we're standing there trimming on the tree that he introduced in Holland. And so Sherman was a customer of his who found this witch's broom in a dawn redwood called White Spot in Germany and it brought him cuttings from that witch's broom and then he grafted it. And then he grafted it and sent signwood to Talon Buckholz who then donated a tree here to the J.C. Ralston and here we were trimming on the tree. One of the first ones in the country too. And a lovely tree, the name uh, Sherman's for the, name, the customer's name there in Germany and Nordlich means northern lights. So you will see this one sometimes sold in the trade as just northern lights, but the correct name would be the first, the Sherman's Nordlich. But a really, really beautiful dwarf, uh, Don Redwood. Don Redwoods, they thought for years were extinct. Then they found them in a valley in China. And then it's crazy because all the selections of Don Redwoods that are now today came from, uh, most of them all came from that one collection of Don Redwoods. Uh, and the Dawes Arboretum actually has a bunch of from another collection they planted a field out and are starting to make some selections from those trees now that were another collection so we're gonna you know widen that gene pool and find a lot more uh, interesting traits which we're already starting to see so we do have a, a version of this from that too that's more of a uh, Dawswood tawny fleece is like this but an orange which was a broom found on one of those genetic uh, new gene collection trees there at the Dawes Arboretum. We're actually allowed to get some of the sunwood off that very early on, and so it's an interesting complement to the Sherman's Nordlich, which is like a blue-green with almost like yellowish hints to it. And you'll notice that a lot of the Don Redwood collections all have about the same size needle. 
Well, from the second collection, the Dolls with Tawny Fleece, the needle is probably two or three times longer than your typical Dawn Redwood that you're, what we're familiar with. And so it's kind of neat that we're getting bronze colors, we're getting longer needles, and uh, it'll be real interesting to see what other genetics are expressed through that second collection. Very similar shape, though, to that Sherman's Nordlich, so they make really cool complementary plants of each other. And so this is a plant that I had to put in here because we saw it at the Arnold Arboretum. I don't know if any of y'all have been there, but this is actually a plant that was uh, from the original 1907 collection of E.H. Wilson. And so this is the, one of the very first ever collections and mentions of Acer Grishin, the paper bark Japanese maple. And so this tree here was 1907. We're talking at over 100 years old. Pretty awesome. We, multi stem tree, it, it, the shape had changed a lot over the years. It's kind of fun one to see though, and that's just there at the Arnold Arboretum. We actually, the Maple Society went to the Arnold Arboretum last fall, and so Tim and I had to track down the, the old Acer Grissom there in the garden, of course. And so we're going from uh, essentially a Chinese tree found and uh, introduced into Western civilization uh, by England, but now we're traveling to the United States. So it's blood good. How many people have a blood good in their yard? Uh, a lot so of people. I'll get off my little soapbox here, but this is my biggest rant. So don't tell everybody online that their red unlabeled seedling is blood good. Because mm -hmm. every time I get in a Japanese maple group on Facebook, we've lost the label. Does anybody have an idea what this red <laughs> Japanese maple could be? That's a blood good. For 40 years, that's always been the answer. Well, truthfully, blood good's a very specific selection that was made by blood good nurseries. They were very early on in Japanese maples in the United States. They had locations at a dock in uh, New York, as well as later in Philadelphia. And uh, I believe the gentleman's name was George Bloodgood, but I have to check that again. But his actual name was Bloodgood. That's where the name, the tree got the name. It wasn't actually from the color. It's so widely associated with color. Everybody comes to the nursery and they say, I want a true red, a blood red, a good blood, a, any variation of Bloodgood you can get, but we know what they're talking about. They want a Bloodgood because that, that name associates so well with the color. Interestingly enough, it was the guy's last name. And like Matt was saying, a seedling from blood good actually isn't a blood good because seedlings don't come back true to form. So if you have blood good seedlings, you shouldn't really label those as blood good. Sometimes you'll see those at Master Gardener plant cells and they say blood good. And while I understand it's a beautiful tree and it's a good way to market it, that's not a true blood good because it's not a grafted tree. Just and like Tim and I, you can have uh, brothers that look completely different. I can handle late day sun, Tim needs late day shade, he burns. <laughs> so, the same thing happens with Japanese maples. You'll get Japanese maples that come from the same parentage but look completely different. We maybe have some similar traits, like we both have big noses, straight <laughs> on the side. But there's, we're, we can be very, very different. And, and while so, we, uh, we, that's we, one of the reasons we graft. We lock in those traits. We'll talk about that in our grafting class tomorrow too, but you kind of know what you're going to get. Think of Japanese maples uh, named varieties as like breeds of dogs. So you know what you're going to get. You know the difference in a Great Dane and a Chihuahua, and you can kind of go with those parameters and kind of get a good idea of the difference in the two. Well, that's what happens with blood because It does get a little watered down because every seedling anybody's ever found, they say, that red one's a blood good, I think. So make sure to tell everybody, hey, unless it's grafted, that's probably not a blood good. And while they may look similar, they may not have, like Matt said, the same heights, fall that colors, five by five. sun tolerance. And so this is actually the, the true blood good, which is a, a really nice plant. So Crimson Queen, I just found out recently that this came from the Vercade nursery. A lot of people, found by John Vercade, introduced in the nursery trade, a lot of people have been trying to figure out exactly where this tree came from. The Vercades actually found this as a chance seedling, introduced this in the nursery trade, and very, while, very famous conifer nursery. They've introduced tons of interesting brooms. A really low growing tree when it spreads out very, very more wide than tall unless it's staked up. And uh, really, really beautiful tree. Needs protection from the hot afternoon sun definitely uh, in the south. One of our most commonly asked questions, and you, you've got a taste of this as you're seeing from England and from Europe and, and from Holland and Australia. We've got a lot of trees introduced in uh, New Zealand now too. And of course all these different introductions from America, people are like, are all Japanese maples from Japan? Well, the species, yes. The species comes mostly from Japan and a few close around regions. Uh, I actually found some populations near and by there in some other countries, but as a species, mostly they're from Japan, where all these different selections are made all over the world now. So that story kind of continues a little bit everywhere else. But a really, really tree made lace, just like Bloodgood, made this popular in America. This made a lot of lace leaves popular in America because people remembered Crimson Queen. While Tamukiyama might not have been as marketable of a name, Crimson Queen was a name that people could remember and say, hey, 
I want a Tamukiyama. There's a lot to a name of a plant too. If it's if it's something you can find and, and name and, and locate and and market, it's it's interesting because we'll have some of the best trees that have terrible names, and some of those trees tend to disappear sometimes. <coughs> and so while this tree was an amazing tree, Dick Wolf went through about 200,000 red Japanese maple seedlings. A lot of them from blood good, a lot of them from red Japanese maples he was finding all around the Philadelphia area. And he was trading a lot of trees with J.C. or with uh, J.C. Relson and other famous plants, but uh, J.D. Bear, Bear trees. trees. Uh, so a lot of these early on plantsmen who were doing a lot of development there were trading all types of interesting plants. And so Bear Trees was sending a lot of his interesting red seedlings to Dick Wolf as well. And Dick Wolf was sending a lot of his green and a lot of other dwarf characteristics and stuff back over to J.D. Bear Trees. It's kind of fun to see that even before the edges of the internet, how the nurserymen interacted and really kept up with each other. But from those uh, trees, Dick Wolf introduced three red Japanese maple seedlings from those 200,000 he looked through. And the, the first one is the Emperor One. So this is kind of an improved form of Bloodgood. Bloodgood's a great plant, we'll always offer it uh, because it's the most popular Japanese maple by name. Uh, Emperor One's kind of an improved form of that. So if we're sending a Bloodgood to Texas, we'll say, hey, maybe think about an Emperor One in Dallas because it's going to outperform that for the heat. Another thing we like about the Emperor One is it does leaf out a little bit later, so it gives a good frost protection. Uh, this is the exact same tree as Red Emperor. So if you've seen Emperor One and Red Emperor, uh, we've actually tracked down the original documentation on that, talked to Dick Wolf's apprentice, and it is the exact same plant. And so uh, Red Emperor and Emperor One, no need to double up there, but uh, Emperor One does predate the name of um, Red Emperor, so we're always sticklers for nomenclature there too. Also known as the Casti tree or Wolf's Red. Those are some other names that this tree's been known under. Because this was the very first introduction of his that said, hey, this tree is really spectacular and really holds its color. This is one of the well. earliest stock plants, maybe the, even the original one there. Uh, it's actually my friend uh, Ed uh, Shin's home in New Jersey. And he has a lot of plants from Lima, Pennsylvania because he would go visit Richard Wolf. So it's fun to go talk to him and hear some of the stories of uh, this retired uh, army guy who was into Japanese maples of, of Richard Wolf. And he has a lot of the original collection there from, from his selections too. So this is another one of the introductions that came from the, those uh, 200,000 seedlings. And this is Moonfire. Moonfire is typically going to have a slightly slower growth rate than the Emperor One. Emperor One typically beats blood good 215 feet. It's like a foot, it's almost a foot and a half of growth a year. People will call and they'll say, how fast does Japanese maples grow? And I'll, that's, it's a big scale. You know, we've got things that don't get three feet even 15 years, and we've got some that are going to be uh, over a foot and a half of growth a year. So this one's typically in that, the Emperor One, I should say, is typically on that upper scale of growth, where Moonfire is very similar, but a little bit smaller long term. And then the, the third introduction from this was Red Baron. And Red Baron wasn't selected for holding its color like Moonfire and Emperor One was, but was selected because this tree really had a very multi-branched habit. So this one will often get equally as tall as it is wide and has thrown up a lot of uh, multiple leaders. So to very it. much this one's going to have more of a round canopy as a nice upright red and uh, very popular for uh, landscaping because in a 15 year period this one's typically 10 by 10 so it rounds out a little bit more to be equally as wide as it is tall. In American gardening we often see trees all the time with one central leader coming up and that makes it into a tree. Emperor One and Moonfire are going to do more of that uh, very often where uh, Red Baron is more like the traditional Japanese gardening where you can have multiple branches coming from the base, multiple leaders, that uh, really makes a tree that can get very wide. And they often call that uh, almost the Yamamiji style, which is like the mountain maple style in Japan. Those are actually the more sought after trees. We have a friend uh, in Japan and he does a lot of like high end, um, like landscape gardening. And so he develops Japanese maples that look very much the opposite of we would in America. So everybody wants a straight trunk, central leader, perfectly shaped, symmetrical in all directions, Japanese maple. And what he sells are basically, you know, specimen type plants for a specific garden, but they're very much more uh, like large bonsai specimens. It has a windswept look or something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more out there for a, for a lot of American gardeners, but it's a, it's a great way to grow. Like Japanese maple shouldn't all look exactly the same. It's a very natural style where it looks almost just like you found this tree growing on a mountain. And basically what it is, when there's a tree needed for a lot of temples or something like that, they'll come to him and get a tree that's grown in its natural form, put it out in the temple, and it looks like it's been there for 30, 40 years. So he'll have three or four specimens on retainer just waiting in case that one tree doesn't make it. He's got three backups that 
look similar enough in design. It's kind of cool to see that level of focus on gardening. So this was Dick Wolf's apprentice, Billy Schwartz. Uh, actually, he called me this week. Billy's such a fun guy. Um, Billy has found more brooms than you can ever imagine. If you talk to him, it's more than you could ever imagine even more. Um, one of those good tall tale guys too. His stories get bigger with time. Billy's found uh, probably, according to him, over a hundred different witches brooms. And different plants. And he, he, he finds them amazing. Like we go and visit him all the time and he's still finding all kinds of brooms. And we'll go visit him and he'll say, come with us, we're gonna look at this tree. We're gonna look at this tree. And it's all these new witches brooms he's finding in Japanese maples. And we can cuttings on them, evaluate them, and we can start growing them out to see if we want to put them in the nursery trade later as this well. This is actually Tim about 10 years ago, so he hadn't changed too much. Julie's probably got a little less hair. This is a gossamer here, which is an Acer Japonicum X palmatum. So it looks like a lace leaf version of a Japonicum. And so, a uh, quick story on Billy. Billy uh, is, uh, is currently a Jewish lawyer in Philadelphia. And he was, when Rare Flora Nursery, the Bergmans were going out of business, he was one of the lawyers that was breaking the nursery apart and selling it off. And as he was doing it, he was like, man, these trees are beautiful. These hmm. trees are amazing. Wow, I really like these Japanese maples. Man, I should have bought that one. And so he's got the crazy stories. He was Muhammad Ali's lawyer as well. And Muhammad Ali caught the flower man. People. It's really, he's got always the best stories. But. And so he's looking at here at all these great Japanese maples. So as soon as he sells off this, uh, all these trees in the auction and sells off the property the Bergmans were at, He's like, you know what? I'm going to go and visit the next guy in the area. So he went and visited Richard Wolf, the guy we just talked about who went through and introduced Emperor One, uh, Moonfire, uh, Hub's Red Willow, a lot of great Japanese maples, and sort of became his apprentice. And he would start traveling around, and uh, he became a guy that was going around and spotting lots of witch's brooms with. Uh, He's broom obsessed more than we are. Yeah. <laughs> and so he is a, a guy who's really, really knowledgeable about plants. One of his, his things about grafting, he takes a very different approach than a lot of nurserymen. He decides, what I want to do to get my seedlings is I want to go out right now is what he does. He goes and visits uh, in Lima, Pennsylvania, Red, uh, Red Maple Nursery. And I want to visit there with him. And he goes around and finds Japanese maples that have twists and curves, little seedlings coming up around. He digs those up. And the most grab, gnarly one possible. The most <laughs> gnarly one possible. And he says, if that tree sur is surviving there, it's going to survive in the landscape. And so he gets these ones that have all these twisted trunks and then grafts on top of that so it has a little bit of a twist before the graft mark. And while he was going around in Lima, Pennsylvania, around Red Maple Nursery that's out of business now after Richard Wolf passed away, he found underneath the Acer Japonica Macanata folium at Red Maple Nursery, the gossamer. So and if you Google Gossamer, I believe it's that big hairy thing that Chase Bugs Bunny around as inspiration for the name because it has that crazy uh, kind of like hairy look to it. Again, that was what Matt and I thought it was, but he actually said it was for the texture of the, the fabric, the Gossamer. Yeah. But, yeah. Anyways, this goes to a bright red in the fall. It looks just like the Gossamer, of course. But really, it's a dwarf Japonicum. Uh, he believes, Billy Schwartz believes this is a... Uh, a hybrid between Acer japonicum and Acer palmatum dissectum. Um, it, it very may well be that, or maybe it's a really, really dissected japonicum. It's extremely slow growing now. So Shane is another introduction by uh, Dick Wolf and uh, Billy Schwartz there, kind of co-founded this one. Shane is actually Hebrew for beautiful. That's uh, Billy's daughter's name. And so uh, mm -hmm. Shana is at the Department of Public Safety on the campus of Villa Toronto. Uh, uh, or just Bill, uh, Villanova. Okay. And Tim and I know this because we were on Villanova's campus and we went and handed them our cards and said, hey, we're here to look at the, the broom and the tree. And they constantly do shift change there and they're wondering who these two crazy guys are out in the rain, jumping and taking cuttings and videos of this, this mutation in the tree there. But uh, by, again, grafting that, we got a smaller, denser version of that tree. And so the original Shana is actually still there on that campus too. But beautiful plant, great for containers. Um, key thing is just to make sure you have uh, really well-drained soil, uh, good tree in the ground as well, and definitely be a lot redder in the sun. Uh, if you give it some shade, it does green up a little bit, but keeps having red new growth coming across. Kind of a pinkish red in the early spring too. Fall color here of the Shana. So this is our friend Talon Buckholtz. Uh, to us, he's the Michael Jordan of Japanese maples. And uh, it was funny because the very first time Matt and I joined the Maple Society, 
we went and we had a uh, they given us posters of his. Talent nursery. still makes fun of Tim for this, by the way. And so when we saw him, he, they gave us a poster of his nursery. We got him, went up and tried to get, get him to sign it. For Tim us. got has an autograph poster from him from about twelve years ago, where he was like, "Hey, would you sign my poster?" And so he's a really as nurseryman, we don't get a lot of autograph <laughs> opportunities. So he, he remembered that one. And so uh, he's been a really really good friend. We trade plants back and forth all the time, and. Uh, has a lot of really neat trees. So some of his most famous introductions, of course, are the Ghost series. First Ghost was the uh, the first of those, and it, you can see why it has that ghost name. It has that reticulated etching to out each leaf. So Shigatsu Sawa, that tree from the 1700s that we talked about first, he had a Shigatsu Sawa that had a sport on it, and it had purple border around the edge. And he looked up there and said it looked very ghost-like. And so he said, huh, that's my first ghost. And so he named it First Ghost, thought it was really, really spectacular. And then had a, a sister seedling he found, a seedling he found, and he said, huh, that's Sister Ghost. Well, I start with the family, Uncle Ghost. <laughs> and so there's Amber Ghost. There's, there's now about eight or nine ghosts of the Ghost series. They all have reticulated variegation. Um, with, you see the edging of the veins, like the uh, Shikatsu Sawa did. But they're extremely, extremely popular. Most of these you want to give some protection from the hot afternoon sun. And they really, really have an amazing show in the spring. Amazing and, etching to each of those. And, and Talon, one of the most famous instruments for introducing trees in the United States. Uh, several years ago, we had the Maple Society uh, come to Asheville. And uh, Talon has a no holds bar blog, if you've ever read his blog. If he doesn't like something, he tells you it stinks, it sucks, it's the worst. And it's kind of no holds bar. So, like, we took him a few places of the Maple Society and it, it stinks, it sucks, it wasn't great. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, so uh, next week's probably gonna be our nursery, so don't be offended if, uh, you know, he's a good friend of ours, and just let it roll off your back if it's not super complimentary. And so the blog comes out and we hold our breath, and it's like the nicest thing anybody's ever said about us. He was like, I wish they were my sons so they could take over our nursery. And I think the next week he sent us every uh, IPPS proceeding from 1960 till the year that was and so uh, he's continued to kind of reciprocate that we'll send him new and interesting introduction that's kind of fun to see him now offering and selling a few of our, our introductions too so a little ways from the autograph that he actually grows a few of ours now which is fun and so here is his Makawi Etsubusa which is slightly bigger than our Makawi Etsubusa it's grown a lot than uh, there but this is his pride and joy it's one of the biggest Makawi Etsubusas in the country and he started looking through a bunch of different ceilings from it and out popped this one here that had orange pink new growth in the spring japanese princess another fun way to get any kids into gardening royalty if it's got princess or prince or anything in that rest assured you're going to get kids into that and gardening they're going to come check on the princess and this tree really has some amazing colors in the spring if you give it more sunlight you get a lot more of those pinks and oranges in the shade it definitely has more of this sort of blondish with pink in there. Beautiful example of Makawi Etsubusa out here by the, by the falls. And ignore the tight, spell. dense growing. But, Palmatum. Uh, yeah. Palmatum. Anyway, but one of the most popular things about this one is it's an even dwarfer, denser tree with that same habit. So it has that bright pink new growth, but an even smaller palette. Typically, this one's only about three to four feet tall, even in 15 years. And Palmatum continues. <laughs> <laughs> Copy Sorry. paste. Copy paste. <laughs> but really, really a beautiful tree. Now, this is a plant that he introduced. It was found as a sport on the cultivar geisha. And Shiraz is another sport that was found independently in New Zealand. Another one of my friends has found this in New Jersey. Uh, we found a small one on a, a sport of this on so geisha. So we didn't need a third and a fourth one introduced, but those are very similar plants, the geisha gone wild and the Shiraz. And Shiraz um, is patented, and the geisha gone wild isn't. So most people do produce uh, geisha gone wild. They are slightly different, but they're almost identical. What this one's famous for is that bright pink on red, especially in early spring. Midsummer it fades to more of a pink on green, and then late summer it's like a, a white with a green border, then go into a red in the fall with kind of pink accents to it. But again, this was found on Geisha. So Talon, with his a very uh, comedic uh, sense of humor, named this one Geisha Gone Wild. Mm -hmm. So this now we're getting into a few of our introductions. We're just about finished with the talk. I know it's getting a little later. This was actually found the very first time uh, Matt and I spotted this one was during our very first grafting class. How long ago was that, Chris? Seven years ago, 
Ah, so 2013. It could be about that time, yeah. 2012, yeah. maybe. So we, we always say, hey, if you have cool new introductions or you have variations that you're, you're evaluating yourself or if you have a seedling and you know it's not grafted and it's interesting, let us know. And a uh, gentleman come up after class and said, you've got to see the seedling I'm growing. Didn't Did any of y'all know Laddie Munger? He volunteered here at the Arboretum. Yeah. This is actually one of a tree that he'd found. It was a little seedling he found off the same Yukaku. Been growing it about 15, 18 years at that point, so a, a good while. And he actually printed off photos and mailed them to us. And we said, okay, you got my attention. That's really cool colors. And so we started growing it and grafting it and evaluating it. And so part of our evaluation process is we always take something. We try to name the five closest things to it. And if you can tell me how it's better or different than those, then maybe it has a place out there. And so we'll evaluate it. We'll send it around to some different gardens around the United States and kind of see how it's growing. One and thing that's just what we did here with the gold digger. And one thing that's great about this one is this one has this sort of salmon pink new growth in the spring. And it often goes more orange in the fall, where a lot of the coral bark is typically more on that yellow side. Bright yellow bark is kind of a soft yellow in the winter. His tree, even on the very older bark, still has a lot of bright yellow, which we were really impressed with, too. In the shade. And like Tim said, early spring kind of blushes a pink color over top of that, that, that spring new growth. It does get more of like your typical coral bark type foliage midsummer, so it's more of a soft kind of Kelly green. <laughs> and so this is another introduction. We were actually visiting the Keith Arboretum with uh, Charlie Keith. Another flat, great garden around here. If you ever have the opportunity to check that out, I think it's now part of a, Sub home, a subdivision. Yeah. And we, we were like, can we collect some seeds off this, this Acer Olive Rainum you have here? And he said, you know, guys, I collect a lot off this tree, and I've never had anything come up from this from this tree. And I said, "We care if we collect, anyways." He said, "Have at it. Collect as much as you want." And we, we did. We love uh, selecting trees in some some not so used areas. So Acer Liviernum is a closely related cousin to the Japanese maple. It looks just like a Japanese maple to most people. It's actually a Chinese maple, and it comes from a little more heat tolerant region in China. And so we could push this zone. You know, essentially something that looks just like a Japanese maple, but can go zones hotter. So Acer Liviernums are incredibly tough, but they're as closely related to the Japanese maple as a japonicum to a palmatum. So they graft onto the same understock and as if, a palm. If you went and visited the Keith Arboretum, you know there aren't many cultivars in his garden. And he has one cultivar of a Japanese maple that has a similar characteristic in his garden. And it's Acer Shira Solanum Arium, the golden full moon maple, which is often very slow growing. Um, needs some protection from the hot afternoon sun. Well, this being a hybrid from Olive Rainum is more than likely an Olive Rainum X Shira Solomon, but that's only, you know, we can only guess that, but it definitely has a little bit of the red border like Arian does in the spring and the yellow color. And a lot of nice bright pink new growth. So the one in my garden right now is in full sun and the, the new growth over it's expressing a lot of pink over top of that yellow. I did get some extra credit. You probably heard me say this before, but I named this one after my wife, Amy. So I got extra credit there by, by calling that one hot blonde. Mm -hmm. Amazing grower though, typically grows about a foot to a foot and a half of growth a year, so it's on the upper scale, maybe even a little bit more than that a lot of years. We had a lot of interest in patenting this one actually in Europe too. So, uh, What amazing, amazing fall, fall color. color. The fall color is electric, and in our greenhouses, it lasts for three or four days. Or not, three or four weeks, sorry, three or four weeks, <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to three to four days with a lot of the other ones. One of the things we liked about it being an Oliviarum, it is a little later to drop leaf, so it's still putting on a show after everything in the garden's kind of drop leaf. You still have a little bit of splash going on because it holds those foliage a little bit later. And olive rams really give good fall color in hot climates. I have a lot of uh, customers down in Bishopville, South Carolina with this with amazing fall color. Got these in full sun in Charleston. It just looks amazing too. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I will open up for questions. I know we probably went a little longer, but everybody's still awake, so that's good. Yes, sir. When you're evaluating uh, seedlings, how many seasons uh, does it take before you have the seedlings that are going to grow? Is it a year, is it a month? Great question. So what he asked basically was how long do we evaluate something before we want to you know, kind of distinguish it as something separate. Our golden rule is typically seven years. Uh, after seven years, after being grafted, so we'll graft it and then and watch that tree. A lot of times by grafting it, you'll see a whole different expression. And juvenile growth can be a lot different than a mature tree. So um, a lot of times people will say, look at this tree, you've got to name this, I've got the sport going on. And it's just juvenile growth. So if you grafted that, it looked the same as a, a blood good maybe over time as a mature. So what we want to do is look at it for about five to seven years is typically our, our, our standard. We'll try to send it to some different gardens and see what's going on there. And then our golden rule too is try to put the five closest things to it with a, we've got around 1200 different cultivars on Palmatum now. 
And so what we'll do is we'll say, what are the five closest things to this? And it's a hard, it's a hard thing to do because you, a lot of people want to introduce a tree. We get so many people that come to us and they're like, I want to name this one after Uncle Bob. It's, I loved Uncle Bob. This one's in his garden. And ah, dang it, I want to call it Uncle Bob. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you. You'll graft it. We'll name it. We'll get it out there. Uncle Bob, we'll get it registered. And it's a red Japanese maple seed. A red upright <laughs> seedling from blood good that if you saw online, you'd say, that's a blood good. <laughs> you know, you're charming right away. And so you, what we try to do is the five closest things to it. And then if you can tell me how it's distinctly better or different than those, then maybe it has a place out And there. it's really important to evaluate a graft from it rather than just a seedling too. Because a seedling may be dwarfed and very dense because it has a really poor root system. And by grafting, we put in a healthy root system and it automatically grows into a big tree with a wide spreading habit that really isn't what you were selecting it for. So we got scared when everybody said they were bum rushing Area 51 because that's what we call our hidden area in the nursery where we hide all of our evaluations. That came about because people would come to the nursery while we're both on the road and dad would sell our one tree that we were evaluating and say, guys, I sold that tree. You won't believe it. The guy, the guy said he'd give me 75 bucks for this one tree. He'd say, Dad, that was the only one. Dad, that was it. Do you have his phone number? Because that was the last one. So our evaluation area became the Area 51 evaluation. And for years, we've had our, a lot of our good friends and loyal customers say, we're breaking into that Area 51. We know where it's at. We're going back there. We're getting the good stuff. So when there's this national uh, online people saying they're going to rush Area 51 to see the aliens, we're in trouble. <laughs> but... Yeah, that, that's kind of our, our stick on that, as we told Dad, look, nothing comes in or out of Area 51 when we're not here. This well, area's on lockdown, so. Okay, so like the... You can, you, can, you can Google it. Yeah? We know where it is. Well, I think what should happen is <laughs> as, soon, as soon as the, the people, no one's going to run in there, because as soon as the first shot goes off, everybody's turning around. But if people muster up the courage to actually run into Area 51, the, the officials there should release like a whole band of people in costumes of aliens running back the other direction <laughs> and just see how brave everybody is that's bum rushing in Area 51. Anyway, and, and at our nursery, if they try to rush, we do have a neighbor who will come out with a shotgun too. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, next question. Uh, another quick one. Uh, is there anything like uh, pollination that takes place in the maple? Great question. And, and you'll have a lot of people that tell you uh, hybridize this specific right. tree with this specific tree. And, and you definitely have those, those guys out there with those skill sets. Normally it's dumb luck, but you do have a lot of pollinators with those skill sets. What we find, we went through 300 pounds one year, 250, 300 pounds of just cultivar seed. And we went to collections that had 300 trees in that collection and collected from them. And we listed specifically Makawi Etsubusas from that collection that had the ability to hybridize with so many different trees. And then we found trees that were very isolated. Now you can't control the neighbor's yards, but we found trees that were very isolated from other Japanese maple genetics. And we looked at seedlings just off those trees. What we found is you found cool stuff across the board. It was the volume of things that actually... And uh, so a lot of times when people think that they're actually hybridizing, they're actually thinking, I hybridized this with this, and I'm looking for this set of traits. An orange one. And then they find one in that set, and they say, there's my hybrid. Now there's certainly people with a skill set to do it. I'm not saying that, but most of your guys who are claiming something to hybrid between the two of the nurserymen probably got lucky with, more. With than Japanese them. maples, typically what happens when you're looking through the set of traits is you're actually just selecting for what you think you're looking for, if that makes sense. There's so much mixed up genetics that we found that you find just as much cool stuff by going through volume as you did going through very specific sets. If anyone has seen Skull Printer Falling, which is very much like the linear, lob uh, linear lobum you all have, uh, over here along the walkway. It's a green, uh, very strap leaf, upright Japanese maple. About 5% of the time, it throws a really, really thread leafed uh, plant that looks like fairy hair. And so there's a lot of different introductions. J.D. Veritrees had an introduction that he called Koto Ito Kamachi in his book on Japanese maples. And it looks very, very similar to Talon Buckholz's fairy hair. And that's because kind of reoccurring genetic trait you find. If you look through that 5% of the time about, it averages out, you're going to find uh, that specific genetic trait. Acer platinoides columnar is another famous one. If you go through all the seeds from that cultivar, you'll find resic. So uh, Acer platinoides resic, which is the gnarly one. There's about eight different, probably, probably about eight different ones now. There's a bunch of different selections. Curly Lampos, from that. Standfast. Carlton. There, there's several. And they're all basically the same plant because they're a reoccurring seedling that's just in those genetics. So if you keep looking, you'll find that one again. Doesn't really need to be renamed. But uh, yeah, you'll find it again. So it's often a numbers game, but it's neat because when you look through the seedlings, you can see the genetic variation that's in that plant. We have to dial that part of our nursery back. That's not really the profitable side of our nursery. <laughs> it gets a little obsessive. You can imagine going through 300 pounds of seeds and then how long are you gonna grow this to fruition before that 
that uh, evaluation is, you know, so it, it, you've got to be kind of selective. We have to dial it back the crazy a little bit on that. But. So how much of the market is got to be new and I'm looking for a traditional tree? I mean, if you put all this work into new stuff. Well, well, for us, it's about, one, starting people off. A lot of people start off their nursery with a Tamukiyama or an Emperor One or a Bloodgood or a Crimson Queen. And then that can be their gateway drug. Right. And then, <laughs> because everybody like, gets in through a, a weeping tree or an upright red. That, like, that's typically how you get into Japanese maples. Like Matt always say, says, what? Japanese maples are like potato chips. You can't have just one. And so once they get one, they love it. Our most requested tree this year is one that's been around since the 1700s. Um, we were shooting the episode with Tony, and they said, walk around and shoot some B-roll. And unbeknownst to us, the audio was still on, so it's a good thing, because sometimes oh. I was just going like, blah, 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 because they were shooting us talking. And so I said, Tony, this is one of my favorite trees. It's from the 1700s. It's called Shiranami. So like a bunch of dummies, we didn't have that one ready when the TV show aired uh -oh. a million times. And so we did have some of those, but we sold them all off in early spring instead of hiding them back for it. Like the other, one we talk, other ones we talked about, I talked about four other ones with <laughs> Joe Lample. We had three or 400 set of each one of those. Ready and waiting and you know. Sure, Nami, we had 15 or 20. Yeah, didn't plan that one out as well. But <laughs> no. the answer is like that. If it's unique, it's it's that's our market is really niche plants. And so that one's been around since the 1700s. It's it's an old cultivar. But if it's unique and different, it's got a place. <coughs> and so for us to, we try to do plants that are unique and that we enjoy. If it's a plant that we don't enjoy, we normally don't propagate those or get, keep those in production because if we don't enjoy it, it's going to be really difficult for us to share that passion with our We kind of just find the things that get us excited each year and we try to produce the ones that get us the most jazzed up and some of those are really old cultivars for sure. We do uh, a ton of ones that have been around a while and we do a lot of the bread and butter stuff too. I mean those are always classics. We always have to have Blood Good and Tukuyama and Crimson Queen available. But yes we do still sell a lot of the bread and butter. I mean with the TV show hit a lot of people came to us and said I want a red weeper or an upright red and then they signed up for the 10 at 10 emails. And they said, oh my gosh, this whole new world exists of crazy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. The number one thing there, good drainage. So you talked about you had someone come in and they were putting nutrients in all their plants. Is that what you're talking about? When you had she had someone... one that was in a container so long that it used up a lot of the good stuff oh. in there. Yeah. So what we try to do in the container is about every six years, check on that Japanese maple, depending on the size of the container, maybe sooner. But typically about every five to six years, if you bumped one into a, a nicer size container, like I'll typically go eight, 10 inches, even bigger on, on the container. Uh, what you want to do is make sure those roots haven't grown into the drain holes that can obstruct the drainage. The number one thing for Japanese maples, good drainage. They don't want to be in boggy wet feet. You don't want them standing in water. For sure, for sure. Now, in the container, you want to check that every now and then. I had one, I actually, I remember talking to you because I told you about the one my uncle had. Yeah. And so there was one in our display garden there my uncle had, and I said, this has been several years ago, I was like, uh, hey, Uncle Glenn, uh, how long has that Tamukiyama been in that planter? Because I'm pretty sure Dad gave you that when I was like in middle school or like maybe before that. That's been there a minute. So I pulled the tree up and it had one little piece of soil it was hanging on to, right? That was all the nutrients I had left. We put that thing in the ground and now it's like twice the size, right? Because it actually was a pretty old tree but it had been a little nutrient deprived for a while. And so the key there, what you want to do is check on those every five or so years in the container. We'll root, you can either root prune them and put them back in the same container, creating kind of a bonsai. And step. adding more soil to the tree. Yeah, getting some more nutrients into that container. Because when we containerize a plant, you know, you, you've got your little micro dome. That's everything that's going to happen in that dome that is dependent on you. So you gotta, you got to check it for grubs and you got to make sure there's not anything going on in there that's going to give it too much root competition and things like that. But what we try to do is check them and then you can either bump it up to a bigger container or the ground or root prune it and put some more nutrients in that container. But uh, if you leave one in a container for forever, they will use up all the, all the goodies that are in there. Remember, if you put it in the ground, it will often get established to take care of itself. If you grow it in a container, it's a great way to extend your garden to your patio, your driveway, your deck, your swimming pool area. But it does rely on you. So if you're growing in a container, that means you have to take care of it because the soil will drop. And what, what you were saying too is, eventually when they used up all the nutrients, it looks great for so long, but then it went downhill quickly because all those, you know, all the nutrients were gone. And so essentially it didn't look like it was starving, but then all of a sudden it was gone. So check those. Uh, I have customers that have 200 plus trees in their collection. They grew everything in containers. They root prune February to March. 
and then they stick them back in similar size pots or bigger pots. And so that's one of the reasons they're popular for bonsai. And if you have a pot that has one of those dishes underneath it, take that dish out, break that dish off, because it's holding water. And when that plant gets roots all the way down to the very bottom of that pot, it's gonna start getting Phytophthora root rot from sitting in that one pot. One of the scariest pictures I get are people say, what's wrong with my Japanese maple? First off, I hate when it's on this side of the blinds, because I'm like, oh no. But then two is when they have a big tray under holding all that water, because Good drainage is, is the number one thing you want to make sure. They like to get completely saturated, then drop completely. But what they don't want is standing wet. That'll what, shut that root ball down. And what Matt was meaning is he hates seeing it when it's growing indoors. Yeah. Right. The very first thing he says on our website well, is Japanese leaves are not meant for indoors. And uh, the other thing to watch out for is weed killer. During the summer, I see it every single year. People send me a photo. They say, what's wrong with my tree? And you don't notice the, the dead. Uh, little perennials you have around the base of the plant that are cheaper, but you notice the Japanese maple because you spent more on it. And you'll notice that it got hit with weed killer. And then I'll say, it looks like some sort of chemical or, or weed killer damage. I say, no, I didn't do anything. And they say, text me back later. My husband did. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you just got to watch out for things, But drainage is, is paramount. That's the number one thing to look for. Japanese maples that you kind of put out and forget about, like once they're in the ground, those look the best. The ones that get too much water and too much fertilizer, those are always the weaker ones. So love them, but just from a little distance. <laughs> What's the story on Germain's gyration? Germain's gyration was uh, found by Van, De Van Den Acker and given to uh, John Isley, named after his mother, uh, Germain. And it had a twisting, contorting habit. And so because that twisting, contorting habit, some people laugh and say, do the Germain's gyration dance, because I always do that whenever I talk <laughs> about it, the twist and shout. But it has that twist and contorting habit, and that's where we get the name of gyration. Um, There's a huge one at, at a customer of ours home that a lot of our grafts come from, and he was offered an insane amount of money for the one on his porch by uh, Isley Nursery. He wanted to put one that big. His is probably planted in 92, and it's probably 12 feet tall, 15 feet wide now. It's one of those trees that looks like a, it looks like a 100-year-old tree in a really short amount of time, and so it does get big pretty quick. You gotta have a space for it, but it's gonna look like a Longwood Gardens tree pretty quick. I mean, 10 by 10, probably in 10 years. Uh, and so uh, it can get quite big. He said he'd rather him drive through the middle of his porch than dig his tree up because he kind of sit in the tree <coughs> on the porch. But uh, yeah, th that one actually has a couple different fun stories. <laughs> but yeah, Isley went through a couple different changes and they were wanting the big germanes and they offered our customer because they'd seen a photo of it and they offered him $10,000 and that said. Yeah, I these, people call me on that one too and this is funny but people say what's that tree it sounds like sex I want to order that one and I'm like I can't remember what it was called but I remember it sounded like something sexual and you're like what <laughs> oh I know what it is now <laughs> yeah anyway that's a little more of the story you needed but <laughs> well that's a good point to stop let's uh, go ahead and move on to the plant giveaway and thank you so much Matt.